my great pleasure to uh, welcome everybody to the audience research group discussion, uh, navigating the pandemic and uh, understanding what audiences need um, out of COVID, what they needed during COVID and how the sector can respond. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. I'm Professor Johnny Freeman. I'm Managing Director of IT Media Research. I'm Academic Lead for Knowledge Exchange uh, for Goldsmiths University of London, where I'm also a Professor of Psychology. I'll just let everyone else introduce themselves too, and I'll go uh, clockwise. I'm going to go to Leah first. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, today. My name is Leah Curter. I'm Innovation Lead at i2 Media. So working across our research projects um, and also developing um, and delivering on our training programmes. Fran? I'm Fran Sanderson, also delighted to be invited. Uh, I'm working, I'm, I'm the um, Director of Arts and Culture Investments and Programmes at Nesta, and I'm working with Leah and Johnny on uh, the Audience of the Future project with the Royal Shakespeare Company. And Nile. Hi, nice to see you all. Uh, lovely to be here. Uh, my name is Nile. I'm the chief executive of a company called Digital Theatre. Um, I've got roughly run two businesses. One that's a direct consumer uh, a digital theatre platform, and the other is an education technology company that focuses entirely on the performing arts. Brilliant. So, welcome to everybody, and welcome to all our. Uh, viewers in our in our breakout Q and A. So we've prepared some slides, which I'm going to share now, and we're going to um, do a short presentation. Um, but the majority of this session is going to be a Q and A. So please, if you have questions about anything that we uh, ask, please um, put the questions in the in the space chat that's on the right hand bar of your window, and to make sure we see them, if you put at and then our names, <clears throat> we'll be able to see the questions and respond um, to them. So as, as I said in the intro on the main stage um, just a few minutes ago, um, we're working together with Nesta and 14 other fantastic organizations in the Royal Shakespeare led uh, Audience of the Future Performance Demonstrator uh, funded by UK Research and Innovation, <clears throat> Innovate UK. Um, and we have been uh, working brilliantly together as a research and technical and creative collaboration over the last 18 months or so, a little bit longer, um, towards what was going to be a magnificent uh, live location-based event experience of Midsummer Night's Dream, Midsummer just gone um, in 2020. Obviously COVID um, required us to change our plans and Sarah Ellis, our project director, came straight to i Media and Nesta as the research partners, research leads on the project to do that on a firm evidence base. Um, what we did was a large scale nationally representative survey of 2,150 participants to understand how people were feeling during lockdown and um, what they were missing the most and uh, what, they, what they wanted to keep them entertained throughout lockdown and beyond. We did that by extending a piece of research we already had planned of segmenting UK audiences and it was more relevant than ever um, in the context of COVID to understand audience segmentation based both on arts and cultural engagement and on digital literacy. Um, and we're, we're going to share that with you um, today. The context, obviously, COVID uh, has caused carnage for the sector. So venues have been shuttered. Artists, colleagues have been left without work. It's been a horrific time and audiences have been left without live entertainment. And the reality is that most of the arts and cultural sector wasn't all aligned to deliver digitally to audiences at home prior to COVID, um, meaning that they needed time and funding to pivot their live offering to meet the needs of audiences in lockdown. And this research is hopefully useful for the sector more generally, as well as very directly for our project. There are much fuller debriefs on, on the full research um, available from, from myself, Leah and Fran. Um, but I just wanted to pull out two or three headlines to, to contextualise it for you. And the first one was, so we did the survey uh, research in late April, so people had been locked in for about a month. Um, and we, we, we identified really early on one of the first surveys in, in the UK to reveal that audiences were feeling incredibly negative during lockdown. Over half of people reporting feeling troubled, afraid, unhappy. Um, demoralized, exhausted, angry. You see, until you get to about sixth from the bottom, uh, they were all negative emotions that people 
were reporting. Now that spelt an opportunity for us. It spelt that actually, if we can deliver content that is uplifting and reassuring and connecting, then that's, that's an opportunity. And we dug a bit deeper. We wanted to know well, why are people feeling so negative? Um, and when we asked specifically focused on theatre and performance, people reported that they were missing live events, not just the jeopardy of being with a performance that you don't know how it's going to go, but also missing being together with other audience members in the theatres and performance spaces. So really clear guidelines from the research to our, digital, our creative partners to focus on something uplifting, to quell the emotional lows of lockdown that is accessible to, to audiences. So that was the background. We then did our original research piece, which was the segmentation of audiences. And this is one of the first segmentations that pulls out very specifically technology literacy, which is on the y-axis there, and arts and cultural attitude or, or uh, engagement with arts and culture. And we identified eight different segments uh, of the population from happy high life to enthusiastic explorers and so on. And Leah will run you through those um, in just a second. How we did the segmentation was statistically, of course, but the input data were about 12 different attitude scales that we developed based on our qualitative research, literature research, and our previous uh, 25 years research in the area. Um, and what we've mapped out here are the, the polar charts of how different segments scored on each of these uh, dimensions. And we're showing them, not for you to examine them in, in real detail here, but just to show the huge variation across the different segments. So happy high life and enthusiastic explorers. So the dotted line in the middle of each of these polar charts is the sample average for the UK as a whole. And you can see enthusiastic explorers scoring incredibly over index on all the dimensions related to arts and cultural attitude, uh, leisure activities, um, gaming activity, social media and technology uses. So these are, are young people who are very keen on technology, want to experience the latest. Um, happy high life, uh, so a matching profile, but not quite as, as active as the enthusiastic explorers. I'm not going to talk through all of them. I just want to show you how when you go to some of our uh, older segments um, and some of our less engaged segments, less engaged with arts and culture, you can see that their activity levels on the polar charts are hugely lower. So like with every good segmentation, it works if it discriminates between different types of audiences and is able to say different types of audiences behave differently, want different things and think differently. Now there's loads more information about in the handout and the resources that we've made available via IT Media's website, which Leah will tell you a little bit about in a second. But first, I'm going to let Leah say a few words about our segments. Great. Thanks, Johnny. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you guys just a, a bit of a whistle stop tour of uh, the segmentation, just pulling out some of the key characteristics of these segments. Um, and importantly, if you're creating new sort of digital works, uh, how you can reach these different segments. So we'll start with um, two of the perhaps easiest to reach segments, and that's the enthusiastic explorers and the happy high life. Now, they do have um, a fair amount that's similar between them. So they're both uh, very highly engaged in arts and culture. So they participate and they, they go out to lots of different things. Um, but they're also very technically literate and they're the most likely segments to own um, a high number of devices in the home, particularly with Happy High Life. Um, they're the most likely segment to actually have uh, VR headsets in the home. Now we know that the population as a whole has very limited access to VR, only about 5%, but of the segment that is uh, that has uh, this uh, technology, the Happy High Life are the most likely to. Now, interested in a range of different content, so whether that be uh, passive content or whether that be interactive, they they like all of that. Could you just pop back a slide, Johnny? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, they're interested in a whole range um, of different contents. Um, the, they're slightly different in that the enthusiastic explorers tend to be a bit younger than the happy high life, um, and 15% of them work in the arts sector. So in terms of reaching this group, um, it's a good way to make the most of that informal arts network. They're likely to spread the word. Um, but both of these segments can be reached via online platforms um, and through more traditional routes, so whether that be TV, or radio. Okay, can move on. 
So the next two segments to highlight are conventional culture and back to back. Now they're quite different. Um, conventional culture make up about 30% of the population. Um, they tend to be retired and um, as the name suggests, they kind of enjoy more traditional arts and cultural activities. So whether that be visiting the theater or going to places of interest. Um, so they're very uh, positive towards arts and culture, but they tend not to be the most digitally literate. Although um, they've been spending a lot more time engaging with technology during the lockdown um, and they reported that they found it enjoyable they were positive towards it and they found it really useful so um, a good way to sort of capitalize on their technology engagement during this time um, but we would recommend that you kind of market more passive experiences towards them rather than the most interactive um, and again reaching them via the more traditional means such as friends family news and radio um, back to back are a much smaller segment, only about 5% of the population. They tend to be sort of busy city dwellers um, and they are sort of uh, typified by the fact that they are quite busy um, and they use technology in order to learn and distract themselves. So we'd recommend just targeting quite short form content at this group. Um, and they have found during lockdown their technology used to be relatively overwhelming. So again, another reason to keep that content sort of quite short. Um, but again, you can reach them via uh, via online. Okay, moving on, we've got mainstreamers and TV families. Um, mainstreamers are quite an interesting group and one of the reasons um, characterized by their polarization. So they are um, not particularly uh, engaged in arts and culture. In fact, they reported sort of the lowest engagement of any of the groups, um, but they're very uh, highly engaged with technology and very digitally literate. So in terms of uh, how you might message and, and market towards this group, we'd recommend really sort of um, uh, emphasizing the uh, the technology aspects of what you're creating rather than uh, perhaps focusing so much on the arts and cultural content, um, that would be the most likely way to engage this group. Um, with, uh, with regards to TV families, uh, they're a little bit like a younger version of the conventional culture segment. So um, they are relatively engaged in arts and culture um, and they and they also uh, own a number of devices at the, in their homes, but they tend to be more traditional. So they tend to engage in uh, gaming a lot and, and watching TV. Um, so any kind of content which is gamified, they might be interested in, so interactive experiences. Um, although they are, and they are also quite concerned around data privacy. So again, that might something to bear in mind um, in terms of the messaging to this group. Cool. Okay, finally, our last two segments. So um, these two segments are really uh, probably those that have the most uh, barriers towards engagement with uh, digital technologies. Um, so that's getting by and the active analogs. They are the older segments um, in the population um, and both of them also kind of more limited means. So they've got a lot less money to spend on these types of experiences. Um, so with getting by, um, they're perhaps a little easier to reach because they do have more access to the internet. They tend to be online more than the active analogs, um, but they do report having poorer connections. So um, they are a fairly tricky group uh, to engage because they're not particularly positive towards technology or the arts. Um, but we would say if you are trying to reach them, then perhaps passive experiences um, and those that are available via um, technologies that are much more widely accessible, such as um, laptops and, and phones. Um, the active analogs, um, as their name suggests, are more analog, so they're, they're not really online either. Um, they really enjoy sort of socializing um, and leisure activities, but again, um, harder to reach. So, um, so that's the that's the tour of the uh, segments. As Johnny said, if you've got uh, if you want to read further on this, we do have a two page um, report on this that we're making available via our website. Um, but feel free to ask us any questions that you might have. I think now Fran's going to talk about recommendations to the sector. Yeah, brilliant. So just to contextualize, so Fran, and, Fran from Nesta and I too have been working very closely together on this research and the whole point of it was to guide our project, the Audience of the Future Performance Demonstrator, but also the sector more generally and there are some key sector learnings which Fran's going to share now. Thank you, Johnny. Thanks, Leah. So how does the sector recover? Because on the one hand, like Johnny said, we've got organisations and creators who've had their businesses but their business models and their livelihoods completely upended by the pandemic and the lockdowns with the particularly painful irony that earned income especially location-based has been the harder hit so the concepts of resilience and asset have been instantly subverted 
On the other hand, we've got amazing evidence of ingenuity and an audience that we know really needs arts, culture and creative content to connect, engage and uplift them. So what needs to happen? Our first recommendation is the development of a skills pipeline to support innovative production. This is broad based and requires both formal education routes and informal skills networks gathering and demonstration from creative technologists who can build a set in Unreal Engine to dramaturgs and directors who understand the limits and possibilities of performance in a motion capture suit and to the people who know how to commission and project manage the full cast of characters in order to come out with a brilliant end product. The second thing we need to do is invest in the tools and methods for virtual production, whether we're talking about staging an entire show in a virtual space or enabling virtual collaboration on location based performance. This delivers huge time efficiencies and environmental benefits too. We need to think about who are the best players to develop, market and manage these tools. Can you move on to the next slide, Johnny? Thank you. Um, so distribution is key. We've all seen the monumental transformation in consumption habits in TV and music over the past two decades and understand how this has shifted our behaviour and preferences as consumers. We have an opportunity now to think about how we can best design a system that concentrates content without concentrating power and optimises the distribution of content to audiences while ensuring that the financial benefits accrue as fairly as possible. We need to experiment with and learn from new payment models testing and learning from how audiences behave and building in the understanding that this behaviour will be dynamic and will evolve and change according to the shifting standards of availability. Premium features such as access and interactivity or agency, as G referenced in her talk, may become a driver of digital, digital broadcast revenues. We do need to be conscious, whilst building castles in the sky and imagining the world of the possible, mm -hmm. that we don't allow technology to become another barrier to enjoying and feeling welcomed by the amazing cultural content we curate and make and entrench that cultural class divide that the creative industries peck noted in their research. The final recommendation is that we take this opportunity to investigate how we can use technology in future to expand audiences far beyond those inside the venue, improving access to cultural output, increasing and diversifying audiences, and building integrated models that optimise both reach and revenue, and make the most of possibilities of a global audience and drive the audience's chance to be included and to participate. I feel like I've not been entirely clear on that one, that what I'm talking about is that we can take uh, performances outside the, the real life space that they're being performed in. So that's the synchronous distribution. Brilliant. Thank you, Fran. Fran, we have one question from Becky Parry in the chat asking, can you just clarify what a pipeline, what you mean yeah, by a pipeline? Skills. Yeah, so that's just a, um, the, the, basically the uh, workforce we need to develop these things and, and being able to train people up and uh, move through that um, ecosystem. Brilliant, thank you. So we've had to do a whistle-stop tour of this, but we, we have uh, been considerate to you, our audience, and uh, put, put this all online on our website. So if you go to i2mediaresearch.com uh, forward slash beyond hyphen conference, you can get a resource pack from this, which is a two-page summary of, of the deck you've just seen. Um, remember, we, we're all pointing in the same direction. We want to meet the needs of audiences and we want to do it in a sustainable way. So we need to generate revenue for cultural organisations. And um, it, wouldn't, it would be remiss of, of us to, to finish our presentation without mentioning that we also uh, offer tools in order for you to measure audience experience, in order to optimise it and optimise what audiences are willing to pay. So on the right hand side of that slide there, you can see a link to the audience impact metric by i2 Media. Um, we developed it with support from Innovate UK, with Nesta and Digital Catapult over the last few years, based on our 25 years of research experience in this space and uh, encourage you to, uh, to go to that website and, and have a read. Um, finally, any questions or follow-ups you would like uh, for uh, from us, uh, please email us at hello at i2mediaresearch.com. And so ends the presentation, if I can press the stop sharing button, um, and we go into the Q&A. <clears throat> um, and Neelay, I'm going to come to you first, because I'm, I'm fascinated by digital theatre's experience over lockdown. Um, and really keen to hear sort of any reflections you have on on the research, anything that that uh, rings bells or that or that you think oh that's a surprise. Um, right. So I mean, firstly, I just want to say like that research and the data presented by yourself, Leah, Fran, all all really impressive. No doubt, it's going to be really helpful in focusing 
all of our collective energy, our innovation in the space. It's really, really, really important. So look, I've got a slightly different perspective. This is not done through research. Uh, it's more I kind of sit on, I run a company that sits on sort of the cold, hard raw end of this uh, vertical value chain here within the theater, uh, the theater industry, uh, certainly the digital theater industry. Um, so just, I just want to add in a couple of, you know, uh, perspectives kind of that we, that, that I was able to see from, from our side. So like I said up front, we had, I run two businesses. One, that's a, a direct consumer experience, right? That's really about um, effectively uh, a, a digital, a, 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 a Netflix for theater. And the, and the other is purely in the education space. And this is about educating in, in high schools and secondary schools around the world uh, and, and, and higher education in, in the performing arts uh, sector. And what we saw from the audience's perspective, what we experienced, you know, I'm afraid we didn't see anything entirely surprising, but it was all very, very interesting. So um, a couple things, our consumer platform, right, which grew very quickly, about three X in a matter of weeks, um, brought in a whole new audience. I think that was one really nice, interesting factor. We just saw new people, new that were new to this entire media and to this, and to this, um, to, 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 to this format. Um, look, we've got a lot to learn about these audiences, but, um, what we did learn was they came on our consumer platform. They came for primarily modern, more contemporary performances, which was really interesting. And I think what we've deduced from that was that was probably a function of both their want and desire for uh, higher quality captures, which would have been done more recently rather than ones that have been done in the past, um, and probably a function of what younger audiences are looking for. Um, the other thing that we saw was that these new consumer audiences were simply not satiated uh, with the breadth or the depth of our library on our on our platform. They want they wanted more choice. They wanted more range. They want more diversity on on screen. They just wanted more, and it, that's not particularly surprising given what they've learned to expect on the likes of iPlayer or, or Netflix or Spotify. Right, depth and breadth, and you know, is is, is critical. Um, and one that I, you know, we were not delivering at the moment. Um, these consumers also wanted, and no surprise here, you know, access to all their devices, ease of use, and premium, premium app experience. Right? Again, not surprising, but but interesting nonetheless. So, in summary, on the consumer side, huge demand, but there's a massive needs gap, and uh, you know, a new normal yet to form here because uh, there's a lot of creative and technical innovation that still got to roll out to audiences, um, but um, but definitely demand. On the education business, um, which is where we've seen more growth and a sustained demand worldwide, we've seen two consumer demands come up, come to the forefront. One, which is that streamed theater performances in their entirety just are not necessarily sufficient for a meaningful teaching and learning experience. They're great, but they're not they're not the whole picture. They're looking for teachers and students are inadvertently looking for what I guess what we're referring to more as the 360 service is, which is with modified formats. So key scenes rather than full production, which is more efficient, that makes sense, right? Given the medium and the audiences, quick on the go, rapid fire, you need to get to the heart of what you're trying to learn or teach. Um, and supplemental contextualizing content. So behind the scenes, more analysis, uh, compare and contrast, assessment, basically answers. Uh, to, to do what, you know, you're going to want to do the app later on. Um, so, you know, these teachers, you know, in this, in this new hybrid virtual teaching environment, uh, you know, they're learning, they're leaning right into this new, what this digital teaching services can provide, um, and, their, and, their, and their demands are increasing. The other is, the other thing that came in, came out was um, on-screen diversity. You know, with access to performing arts massively expanded via digital distribution, which is one of the clear uplift of digital distribution is you just get to expand your audience well beyond the core what you may have experienced before, is that the audience profiles are significantly more diversified than the average theater audience. And their need to see a more representative version of society has become a massive priority. This has been an overwhelming sort of bit of feedback we've gotten from our from our customers, um, which again has been So I just thought I'd just add in a little bit of extra sort of layer to that from what we've seen um, from sort of the raw end of COVID, uh, as, as it were. Brilliant. Thank you, Neelay. And uh, we're going to go to some of the questions in the sidebar in, in just a moment. But um, 
one of the, one of the things that, that struck me. So you've had a massive sort of increase in in appetite for for digital theatre and, and what you're what you're distributing and uh, and monetizing, and your catalogue does not yet sate audiences sufficiently. So you're not yet the Netflix of it. So are you are you kind of uh, reinforcing the the need for skills and the need for more digital capture of, of productions? Yeah. So I think if if you work back from the obvious, if you want to create a deeper library, one is going to have to license more content, which throws up one uh, overarching challenge within the industry, which is around the understanding of digital rights and distribution. Right. So there's there's a gap there that we found immediately when going out into the industry, like. Ooh, this is very tough. We 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 have a capture. We have no idea how to necessarily go out and secure all the rights in order to distribute that appropriately so everyone gets paid appropriately. So there's there's a skills and understanding mm -hmm. awareness factor that that's a hump right there from preventing that from being fully um, fully uh, utilized and leveraged. The other is I guess you can one can capture more content, which is clearly going to be something that we all want to explore um, and do more of. And then that's where you uh, uncover even more sort of gaps in knowledge and awareness, both from a technical awareness, right? How does one do, uh, you know, how, how does one set up the right cameras with the right encoding systems to patch into the right streaming services to get to the right audiences and integrate your ticketing platform and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a whole technical, technical value chain that needs to be understood and more deeply uh, explored. Then there's a creative one. Right? How does one capture the right experience for audiences? Well, who knows? That's a, that's a test and learn experience. Uh, that's been going on for a while. That's a process. Right? Is it three cameras, 10 cameras, one in each of the three locations across the theater? What, what do audiences want um, is, is another. There's all sorts of interesting skill gaps that are being sort of opened up and unearthed there um, as, as we go in and try to, try to create more volume. Brilliant. Thank you, Nilo. Fran, I'm going to come to you with a couple of questions that we've had um, from, from the audience. And the first one from uh, Agnieszka, which is like, uh, hang on, we're hanging by a thread. <laughs> You're telling us to invest in digital and uh, put everything online and risk losing our audience loyalty. Um, I mean, you, you answered, I think, a little a little that it's not, not the sector itself that needs to be um, paying for it all. Can you just expand on that, Fran? Yeah, I think that's just where um, I would call for more support uh, nationally for that skills development and a recognition that that's a national asset that we need to develop in order to um, utilise and my favourite word, exploit all of the uh, uh, talent that we have, particularly with um, what's happening in January in terms of uh, skills and um, migration. So I think that's that's a real priority for the government if, if they want to stay ahead um, in this area in terms of creating content so it wasn't i wasn't trying to say come on guys uh you're just dusting off from um probably making redundancies go on go and invest in some digital skills it's more that that needs to be provided for our artistic workforce mm -hmm. brilliant and are we aware of any interesting developments in the digital pipeline skills gap that we've, that we've discussed so um obviously the, there are courses at goldsmiths at portsmouth at story features um all, all training the next generation of professionals in, in this space um any are, are there still gaps that, i mean do we think it's enough at the moment yeah i think one of the things is that um as nina was as alluding to there the uh the gaps are emerging as fast as we can fill them probably because we're just finding out what it is that we need and and what the stuff is that we're trying to make and who needs to know what in order to get that done um and like i kind of alluded to in the um it's also about how to structure those projects and how, what kind of management skills you need to um, and what, what um, organisational structures within projects you need to get those done well. So there's a whole load of learning going on. Um, I think what's really interesting is that there's also thinking about the scope of learning. There's so much um, self-teaching that goes on now from, from YouTube with all of these skills or anything from GitHub. Um, I know that Digital uh, MS UK were having some kind of unity workshop. So just it feels like the, the learning infrastructure and ecosystem um, is really dispersed and it's just trying to work out how we or who who does coordinate that in order to get the greatest benefit and the greatest access as well so it's not just something that's only available to people with industry formal education needs brilliant and also just to, to promote uh, one of our project partners the space um, are going to be coordinating a whole series of workshops um, on skills uh, relevant to what we've been discussing today um, 
coming out of the audience of the future projects and, and sharing our learnings as widely as possible. We, we're, we're well aware we've been in quite a privileged position to carry on doing the work that, that we were doing. Um, Leah, I'm going to come to you in just a second on, on applications of the segmentation, but I'm just going to answer one question so I don't forget, uh, which came in earlier. How far did we get with the uh, with the, the physical production before um, before we had to, to pivot? And the answer is a very long way. And a lot of the creative, um, in, to the extent that it, it can could be pivoted to digital, um, is maintained. But with uh, the creative decisions that have been the creative team's decisions, just with an awareness of of audience. So, um, Leah, in terms of how how people can use the segmentation and um indeed how our partners in in dream like how they use the segmentation to to, to almost sculpt and, and set their boundaries yeah i think that's um an interesting one and certainly something that we're finding in the performance demonstrator is that you know i think perhaps it's easy to think about a segmentation as maybe quite a static um piece of work but actually it can be used in a very dynamic way um if you think about it from a sort of an audience centered approach you can really use that segmentation quite early doors to of course um think about the audiences that you most want to reach but also to be thinking about those that you are um you know that perhaps you're not reaching it helps you to inform your uh, your distribution channels so which channels are you going to be reaching certain audiences with which ones will perhaps be missing out um and we also find so we find that it's useful for sort of putting constraints around uh, creative decisions that you might be making um and and also it's used as a way to kind of help your team align around how you describe your audiences. So you're probably going to be communicating with lots of different stakeholders around who your audience is. Um, so we find it a really helpful way of having a shared common language that uh, really kind of transcends different uh, teams to talk about your audiences. Um, the other good way to use it is when you are perhaps conducting audience testing, um, use it to inform your sampling criteria. So try and make sure to have um, a, a good range of audiences that you are testing your content with. So we try to get at least a few from each of those segments and we're doing kind of rapid uh, scale test, uh, rapid testing. Um, and finally, it's quite useful for uh, thinking about the research questions that you might want to be asking uh, in the future. So how are you evaluating the success of what you're creating? Where are the gaps? Um, so there's a whole range of ways and I would really sort of recommend that you um, use it as something that you can kind of carry through from the sort of first stages of uh, a new piece of work right the way through to how you um, evaluate and, and market to those different groups. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, Leah. Um, now, I want to get on a little bit more to, to business models. So I know when we were preparing for this um, this session, uh, we, had, we all met up last week and we had a great uh, chat then about, well, look, the appetite's there. Hundreds of thousands of people have watched live streams of theatre um, during during lockdown. There's two questions. One, one of the really important elements of the segmentation is that it makes explicit what devices people can access content on. Um, so you can you can make the, the flashiest, most interactive, sixth off, fully immersive VR, and very few people in the UK or even globally will be able to see it because the technology isn't there at the moment. Um, I want to come to Nile on the question of what, what do you know about the devices people are accessing your your streams on? Um, is, are they watching it on their projectors or TVs or are they watching it on their smartphones? Um, and then uh, what are the pros and cons of releasing content for free? <laughs> um, right, so the first, um, look, again, probably no, no surprises, but you're, we, we see access on all screens. So just a full range, what was probably at the beginning of the year was very much web-based laptops and desktops. Um, and as we migrated through COVID, you just saw mobile uh, increase significantly and, and the biggest screen in the house, the television, it, from, from two factors, right? One, you've got consumer, our consumer business, our direct consumer business, people want to ultimately watch their, their, their lovely production on the biggest screen, the best screen with the best speakers in the house. So it's going to go to the television. So that's absolutely no surprise there. And uh, the small screens are, you know, those are students ultimately. Uh, on the go, on the move, in between classes, um, doing doing what they need to do to get their content in. So, you know, it, you can't bet on a particular screen. It basically has to be a great experience on all screens. And that, that's kind of the, the, the walk away. That's, that's those are table stakes. Um, 
And then your second question, uh, I guess, in terms of um, content, giving um, content away for free. So I guess in the consumer space, this is around, you know, looking at this particularly from the perspective of um, uh, theaters streaming their content. Um, I, I think at this stage, it's important that as a new, entirely new vertical in industry is gonna get formed here, which is really, really exciting. One needs to make sure that we're gonna maximize the value of this new industry, this new, this new extension of the industry, I should say, sorry, right? Value uh, optimization is really, really, really critical. And one doesn't want to undervalue or devalue this incredible work that gets done on stage when it gets put out into TVs and screens and whatnot. That doesn't mean one can't experiment, right? And I think different institutions, different formats, different um, distribution models are all, experimentation is all part of it. Pricing, promotion, all of that's part of it. But um, I do feel um, that making sure that there's a very healthy and clearly understood value exchange between audiences and their content is made as early as possible. Um, and you don't create a, you don't create a baseline or a, a feeling that people should just get this stuff for free. So it's just not, it's not true. People take their lives and, uh, you know, in, in, into this incredible high value work. We want to make sure everyone yeah, has a good value exchange. Yeah. And Fran, anything that you would sort of posit as a value of, of, of giving, giving content away for free initially? Well, I guess a lot of, um, uh, in the UK where we've got public funded arts organisations, you can sort of see that someone like National Theatre is getting a really big grant from the Arts Council. Um, might feel that they do have, you know, they, they will generally have sort of uh, duties associated with their grant to increase access to their material. So they might, I, th I think there is a, a public benefit um, uh, imperative there. And I think lots of, you know, arts organisations are generally very um, socially focused and community focused. So I think that, that that is on that side, I completely agree with Elay that you, um, people shouldn't get used to seeing this stuff for free um that doesn't work for anyone in the long run uh, people don't value it either um what they're watching if they're not paying for it i think mm -hmm. uh, in general, that, that i should say um i did have another point there that uh when nino was speaking um but it has drifted off if you want to talk about something else i can but in if it comes back <laughs> we'll, we'll wait for that one that one to 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 return leah in terms of oh sorry Nilo. I think there is an important point though that Fran has made there that I, I really want to press on, right? So accessibility is there's a fine balance here between charging, maximizing margins, etc. But that usually comes at the expense of the size of your audience and how accessible you can make things. And the theater industry is one industry in particular that does not have a particularly great accessibility to um, uh, outside of usually major cities where there's theaters or people who come from a very particular socioeconomic background and if there's there, there is a role that public service gets to play here which is brilliant especially in this country um, but pricing and distribution does allow you it, it's one of the great things about digital distribution that when you scale sufficiently you get to price uh differently as well and you get to in a world where um you know music's a good example right i would have to as a kid i would have had to pay twenty dollars per cd for every bit of music and now i pay ten dollars or twenty dollars per month you know, for unlimited 27 million tracks, right? There's just a different, and, and now so many more people can get access to that level of music. There's an equivalent here, there's an analog to the theater, I, I have no doubt, and we'll have to find that sweet spot. Definitely. Um, <laughs> Go on, man. So, um, about the business models, and, and I think we're a really interesting place, re-cooperation and competition. So obviously the fact that people have now um, got access to you know, a much broader audience means that organisations who might not have previously felt themselves in competition with each other will be. <clears throat> so I do think there's a question about how we share the learning and how the kind of um, information is hoarded on the new business models that, that we figure out how to distribute that so it benefits everyone as well. So just, just thinking about, and again, I think that's probably a role for a national agency that's a little bit independent that thinks about how can, how can you balance those two forces of, of collaboration that's so important, but also recognizing um commercial sensitivity and competition yeah and leah i'm going to come thank you fran and and leah, and leah i'm going to come to you on um it's kind, it's kind of a hybrid of what what we've just been talking about um, um so what our kpis for for the audience for future performance demonstrator were meaningful experiences of very large numbers like so a minimum of 100,000 uh audience and um 
we've addressed that obviously by uh, making sure we're distributing to devices people can access the content on, um, that, that any charge won't be excessive and certainly not within the, the, the project, not off-putting. Um, and we, we're finding the opportunity for new audiences from, from this. And I think that Neelay hinted at this is in terms of once you are distributing at much greater scale, the pricing question and the sustainability question becomes a different different question. So in turn, and I saw Agnieszka also talked about um, finding new audiences and, and then retaining them. Um, what what have we from our segmentation? What are we which are the segments that we think are are our new audiences for creative and cultural content? Yeah, so I think the the newer audiences are within that um, enthusiastic explorer range. I think Nile, you described them quite well when you were saying, you know, they want they want more. They kind of want everything. Um, you know, they want different formats. Um, they want a really um, broad catalogue of work. So as much as we are identifying them, we also know that they do have their expectations are, um, you know, are quite uh, they're quite in line with um, the expectations that audiences of Netflix have um, because they're used to seeing that sort of broad catalogue of work. But, you know, it does present um, some really interesting opportunities to play with different formats, um, to try different types of content. So I think, you know, really short form experiences could become um, something that uh, become very successful. So we know that uh, audiences are really willing to engage in content in lots of different contexts. So we don't need to think about audiences necessarily sitting down at home um, and watching performances. They might be on the go. So, um, so yeah, that that segment. Um, and you know, I mean, it's not just that segment. We've also got our back to back segment that are you know these busy urbanites that again perhaps might value this short form content. So. Um, so yeah, and, and we also know quite a lot about their emotional state. So we know that they are uh, feeling um, perhaps overwhelmed by uh, by lockdown, more troubled, um, and so it gives us clues as to type to the types of content that we can be uh, trialing with these different groups. Brilliant. I'm going to stay with you, Leah, for a second, and then I'm going to come come around around my screen. Anyway, um, I was going to say around the table, but you know what I mean. Um, so we take, we've talked a little bit um, already about applying the insights from, from this research and from Neelay's experience to, to distribution of live arts and theatre. And there was a question earlier in the, in the, um, in the chat uh, asking, is the future going to be a hybrid future, which is the point that Fran um, finished on of, of her sort of sector, um, sector insights. Um, does it just apply to arts, theatre and music or, or where, where else does it apply to? Well, um, in terms of hybrid events, you mean? In terms of the segmentation and then does that speak also to hybrid? Yeah, so, um, you know, the segmentation, because it covers broadly, you know, technology access and, uh, and, um, and positivity towards technology and sort of highlights where people have uh, perhaps, um, you know, um, they they don't perhaps have the digital literacy to engage in all forms um it does make it it does make it broadly applicable to any kind of um, arts and cultural institution so it's not just the case that it would be applied to theater say um i think you could apply it to uh, to museums uh, to galleries anywhere that where there's digital innovation and we know now that that's within most of the arts and cultural uh, institutions it's not just the case that this is happening in theatre of course it's happening um across the board so um because it is it is generalizable to lots of different sectors and we're very happy to um you know to work with different uh, organizations if they want to look at how to apply that segmentation directly to their work then that's something that we can do uh, either by looking at existing data sets that you have um, and seeing how it maps onto the segmentation um or if you're starting from scratch so yeah it is really broadly applicable yeah, thank you. And in terms of, sorry, the question about hybrid events. Um, so I think my my hunch on this is that you know we're we're social creatures. We're missing the togetherness of being with other audience members. We're missing live. So I think in the future, audiences, of course, are going to want to go back and get together in person. But I think um, that the 
the digital work that's happened during lockdown has really allowed for us to see that there are audiences that do have uh, do have appetite. It's not the case that everybody is going to be able to access events in person. I think we also need to think about those people that perhaps are going to feel quite nervous about returning to live events. Um, so yeah, I do think there's a good opportunity for hybrid um, events to start to take place and for us to um, to capitalize on that. Brilliant. Well, and I'm going to come to you in a, in a moment, Nile, um, because also another question uh, around sort of for the education aspect. So this just to give you time to prepare for it. For the education aspect is, is the curriculum a key sort of driver of, 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 of focus. But I'm going to come via Fran. Um, and Fran, obviously you run the Arts Impact Fund, Arts and Cultural Impact Fund at, at Nesta. Um, the insights that, that we've got from performance demonstrator, I mean, you work with galleries, with cinemas, with a whole range of different art forms. Um, how, how are you advising your, your, your cohort to, to, take, to take note and, and learn? I guess we, um, so typically we, we're quite a responsive fund and we have been thinking about how we could put a call out to say, uh, you know, to try and, if you build it, they, they will come as if like, here's some money, this is available potentially to help you pivot. But because we need to have some sort of track record because they're investments rather than grant funding mm -hmm. um we're just wondering how we can structure that without kind of like the right um it, it feels a bit unfair to expect very great predictability on some of these things um, that you would need for investment uh but certainly what is interesting is that the investment committee who makes the decisions um is feeling more confident about digital ventures because uh obviously we've we've just all sort of seen that the audience is there i think that's it's been really expansive in terms of um what how organizations will be able to engage with people who aren't in in their walls maybe able to build a transactional relationship with them also from the impact side again what we referenced earlier the fact that you're able to access different audience members and different audience members they kind of blurring the line between the have the haves and the haves not have nots and the it comes and it can't come. So, um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's an interesting time. I do think there probably is a bit of R and D funding that um, is potentially missing. We need to think about how to bridge that gap to make sure that people are able to do that experimentation, have the freedom to fail without uh, you know a, a, a lender breathing down your neck, which is what we are. Brilliant, thank you, Fran. And, and to Neil, I'm going to come. So the question from the audience was uh, in the Q and A was. And to what extent the curriculum drives um, interest. And I wanted to sort of marry that with what you, you were interested also, um, or you mentioned earlier, really interesting, um, the, that it's not just the, the, the video the, of, the, of the performance that, that people want, it's resources around that. And I'm, I'm wondering uh, the extent to which you, you've sort of planned around that and, uh, and are you exploring any sort of hybrid um, solutions in that space? Right, so um, I guess to answer the, the, the oh, call. Right. No, I can hear Nino. Yeah, okay, just want to make sure. Um, the, so at the core of it, so it, curriculums in the education space will drive the, the, the vast majority of the interest from schools, right? It's alignment with curriculums, making sure it's very clear. We've got all the teaching materials and a range, again, depth and breadth around each curriculum uh, uh, um, uh, text, key study text within those curriculums. Now, what we've seen, however, is we've seen requests for sort of modern interpretations of those key texts, right? Which is really, really interesting and really fun. So we just uh, were very lucky enough this, during the lockdown actually to work with German Street Theater, where we, uh, we partnered and we did a production, of, or they put on a production, we, we captured um, a production called 15 Heroines, which is um, sort of a, a modern, uh, modern takes on 15 um, soliloquies from the Greeks, from the Greek, from Greek theaters, which have studied very heavily, particularly in the United States, um, and but all very modern takes on those. And and they are in America, they are loving, like absolutely loving the particular project that we've put on. Um, so yeah, we, we we see sort of that hybrid of the uh, old uh, with new coming together and just making it more relevant for for kids, as you can imagine. It's not not again, not not going to be a big surprise from that. Um, and then in terms of uh, did we react and how did we react around um, sort of moving beyond just the core productions and then moving into sort of more the 360 stuff. So 
as, as I referred to. So yeah, we, look, when, when school shut, which was you know, third week, second or third week of March, when not every school in the country in the world basically closed down, and the teacher was faced with the nightmare of having to try to teach theater, drama remotely. Um, luckily, our education team swooped into action and went very quickly into how to, not just to create virtual teaching um, tools and tool sets, um, sorry, not just the content that, that can be delivered virtually through our platform, but we also had to create content and guides for teachers to teach virtually because most teachers wouldn't have been prepared for that. And why would they? Um, the platform was there and it was mainly used historically for um, what we refer to as a flipped classroom model, which is teachers can send their kids home with, hey, go watch, um, you know, Hamlet. It's got the guy from Breaking Dead in it. It's super cool. You can watch that tonight and then come back in tomorrow. And we'll talk about it which is very different than go home and read the play or let's all, let's all sit in a circle and read the play together. Um, and it just changed that whole experience. But this took it a lot further. The lockdown took it all the way to, you know, we're not coming into the classroom to talk about it. You're just going to have to do everything remotely from home. And so we put a lot of virtual teaching guidelines, tool sets, kits together for, for teachers from that perspective. So yeah, we've, we, we reacted, I think, very, very quickly. And it's been, it's been taken up very nicely and appreciated by, by the education sector. And then right. you know, but I can't remember. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I was going to um I was going to sort of push you further on. So obviously you fulfilled a vital role during lockdown in, in supporting uh, theatre and uh, theatre and, and drama education. Um in terms of sort of Fran's sector recommendation right at the start of we need to develop the skills pipeline further. So have you got in your in your roadmap? working with film studies students and uh, computer games students, even at, at, uh, at school level, A-levels, um, to, to even expand your impact further? Um, we, we don't have any direct plans right now in terms of helping very specific tool sets being created other than to, um, which we think is our, currently our most effective way, which is that we, we've been capturing, we've been doing end-to-end -end capture and distribution for 10 years now. So we, we've got in-house skills for this and, um, and so we recently did uh, a capture, uh, a production called Negative Space um, with, uh, in partnership with uh, Salford University. And part of the agreement there was like, hey, can we do this with you? So we do a skills transfer from digital theater over to the folks at Salford University. So they are part of that process and learn how to develop those skills of how to, how to capture, stream, and distribute these things. So I think for us, for now at least, it'll be around working directly with theaters, theater groups, production companies to transfer the skills that we've developed over the years. Whether they're, whether they're the good ones or not, we're all going to grow together and innovate and get creative together, but we've definitely had a good head start, so we're happy to work with just about anyone on this. Brilliant. So, so Neelay there was sort of hinting that convergence is, is clear in, in the space, so the, the, the arts and cultural sectors and previously digital and previously physical are, have by necessity um, converged. Leah, in terms of understanding how to optimize impact from converged experiences, what tips have you got? You're on mute. Um, yeah, so we've been uh, developing a training program actually. Uh, if you want to know more about sort of what's impactful in terms of converged digital experiences, from a psychological perspective, so thinking about the audience experience. Um, and impact, uh, we are, our impact course is actually an acronym of uh, six factors that are very important um, to consider. So uh, I'll just run through them very quickly. That is um, interesting. So audiences have to find your content interesting. That might sound um, obvious, but um, you know we have to think about the drivers of the audience, what's actually gonna bring them to your content. Um, they have to find it meaningful. So uh, thinking kind of broadly around you know, I think the discussion around kind of the role of arts and cultural organizations and the they bring to people's lives is really important. Um, they also need to be personalized. So I think Neela, you're speaking about kind of giving kind of more personalized experiences and playing around with format. That's also important. Um, they need to be affective. Um, so that is the emotional journey that the audience goes through. It needs to kind of have highs um, and lows. It needs to be varied. Um, 
Uh, they need to also be collective. Um, so that sense of kind of coming together in the live performance and kind of giving audiences a sense of one another is also really important. And finally, they have to be transportive. So they need to be able to kind of engage the audience and take them to uh, take them to that place that the uh, that the performance is trying to take them to rather than being kind of distracted. So um, I'm happy to answer more questions on this um, or if you're interested, please get in touch with us because we have a whole uh, training program which is around yeah, creating optimised, impactful digital experiences. Brilliant. Um, and Fran, I want to come to you um, on, on your vision of, of the future. Is, is this all going to just go away once life's back to normal? We're all, the cavalry comes over the mountains, we're all vaccinated. Will we all forget about this? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think there'll be permanent shifts just like there are. Um, I mean, for example, if city centres become less focused around uh, office spaces, then that will have a huge impact on cultural offers within city centres. And, and so there'll be kind of a, a demand shift there. Um, and I think there is, you know, also the, the trend towards interactivity and the blending of, of the models between um, uh, cultural content and gaming is going to carry on that way, especially as the um, population ages, as, it, as uh, well as the, <laughs> the digital natives move further up the population. Um, and certainly, what you know, thinking about what my teenagers demand from a cultural experience, a respectful cultural experience, is very different from mine. So I think no, I think this is. Um, uh, I think it'd be a missed opportunity if we saw it that way, and we expected everything to go back to normal. But I think it's worth recognising that our um, I think arts and cultural organisations have always been, um, maybe this is unfair, but it's, it's always felt like you've had to make extra special effort to innovate and inertia has been rewarded. So I think trying to change that um, uh, in terms of the incentive structure for innovation, um, I keep going on about this, but I think that's really important. And just to make sure that um, uh, the, the, the conditions are right for, for that to happen and, and all the um, all the incentives are aligned. Brilliant. I'm going to come to Nilo in one second. Just you'll see in the polls on the on the right hand side, I've uh, I've asked the audience at home or wherever you are watching this from um, to, to categorise yourself to one of our segments. Um, this is just for our interest. And uh, if you want to find out if you're right, you'll have to get in contact with us and uh, tell us a bit about yourselves. Um, Nilo, any, any uh, final message from you before we wrap up? Uh, final message, but I think it'd be the, almost to Fran's point, we've got to, a moment's been provided to us. Uh, we may not have liked the, the, the forcing function itself, but a moment has been created where we're getting forced to take some initial core critical steps. And um, the key in innovation is just to keep moving. Never stop, never go backwards. You got to always take that step and keep pushing. You're, we're, we're now going to push out into really some unknown territories. Uh, so it may feel that way. We do have some really interesting uh, uh, case studies, though, from print media, music industry, TV, movies. I have all many billion dollar industries that have had a good head start by two decades in some cases. So we're not going into a dark abyss. We're going, we're, we're eyes, eyes open. We, we, know, we know the direction. So the key for me, my, my guy, is just keep moving, work together, um, and be brave as we, as, we, as we go along. But collaboration is going to be at, at the heart of all this. Brilliant. Thank you, Nile. Um, so Nile, Fran, Leah, thank, thank you all for, um, for sharing um, and for being so, uh, so great on the panel. I'm just going to leave with a final note to our audience uh, at home that the resource pack is available on our uh, website, itmediaresearch.com forward slash beyond hyphen conference. And there's information there also on the audience impact metric, which can enable you to work out pricing strategies and work out what your production and content is doing for audiences, the, the good and the bad. Um, and I think we now close at 13.40. So uh, thanks very much for, for joining us. Uh, it's been great. Any questions, Thank please you. do follow up. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Nilo. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.